Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to use this personal statement to place on record what an incredible job this is and to encourage others, particularly women, who are thinking about public service, that you really can make a positive difference. Since 2010, we have lived through three general elections, three <coughs> referendums, I have worked for three different Prime Ministers and even had just two tilts at the top job myself. <laughs> and During that time, we have learned a lot. First, there's the value of a punchy catchphrase, from long-term economic plan, remember that? <laughs> to take back control, yeah, yeah. to get Brexit done, or as we like to say, got Brexit done. Yeah. Yeah. But it's the action behind these words that has given us the highest employment there's ever been, a superb Conservative majority, and a free and independent United Kingdom. Yeah. I've also learned the value of knowing exactly what you're voting for. So, for example, colleagues, if your whip tells you, as a new BMP, to go through the I lobby and vote for something called the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, <laughs> just say no. <laughs> And the Chamber has learned a lot about Erskine May, from the precise meaning of forthwith to the specific purpose of an SO24, and even how a Speaker should vote in the event of a tie. But the key lesson for me has been the importance of focusing on your beliefs and behaving with honour, whatever the cost. When I arrived in this place, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, if not strictly youthful after 25 years in finance, my ambitions for what I called my three Bs – Brussels, banks and babies. Brussels, or Brexit, started out as an enthusiastic attempt to reform the EU from inside. I set up the Fresh Start project with my honourable friend for Daventry and my right honourable friend for Camborne and Red Ruth, with support from 200 colleagues. We set out the case for EU reform, but it soon became clear that that wasn't on offer and the rest is history. Now, this time coincided with my first ever rebellion against a three line whip, as one of 81 Conservatives to vote for a referendum on EU membership, leading to media speculation that I had told the Chancellor, George Osborne, if you'll forgive me, Mr. Speaker, to F off. <laughs> well, I can assure you that there is only one person to whom I might be tempted to provide such frank advice, and that wouldn't include any former or current Chancellor. And certainly not any current speaker. <laughs> My second B, banks, was a personal mission after seeing the damage done by the financial crisis and Labour's lack of oversight. As a new MP elected to the Treasury Committee, I could hold the banks to account over LIBOR rigging, stop their plans to scrap checkbooks, and also challenge our brand new, as was described at the time, rock star Bank of England governor over QE and the Euro crisis. City Minister was my first job in David Cameron's government, working to introduce new pensions freedoms, setting up the ring fence for banking groups, arranging for the post office to provide banking services on the high street, and actually recovering over a billion pounds from the Icelandic government after the bailout of Icesave. And then after David Cameron's excellent win in 2015, I was moved to energy with my good friend Amber Rudd as Secretary of State. We rebalanced the needs of the fuel poor with speedy growth in renewables. We announced that coal would come off the grid entirely by 2025. Yeah, yeah. And we kept the lights on through one of the tightest winter energy margins ever. Yeah. And that was the year of Paris COP21. And it's a real source of pride to have joined that global effort to tackle climate change. And I wish my right honourable friend, the member for Reading West, huge success as yeah. COP president when the UK plays host later this year. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the result of the EU referendum in June 2016 is right up there with England winning the World Cup yeah. for rugby 16 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's right up there with the look on John Burko's face when I told him to apologise for calling me a stupid woman. Yeah. And it is a bit behind the happiness of my wedding day. Oh. But not surprisingly, the leadership election that followed is also forever etched in my memory. My own part in Brexit was always about doing what I thought was best for the UK. And whatever has been said about it, my decision to withdraw from the final two was to give the country the urgent certainty that it needed. 
I'm tempted to say something about a mother, but I'm just not going there. <laughs> but as the new Environment Secretary in 2016, it was amazing to be setting up the huge Brexit project in the department to deliver for farmers and fishing communities the bright future they were promised. Developing the 25-year environment plan, banning sales of modern ivory, creating the first ever litter strategy, and introducing CCTV in slaughterhouses. They were just a few of the highlights. But throughout the time I spent in her cabinet, I fully supported my right honourable friend for Maidenhead in her determination that Brexit should mean Brexit. Mm. And during my two years as leader of the Commons after the 2017 election, the challenges of a hung parliament became so evident right from day one. Delivering pizza was hard enough. <laughs> Delivering Brexit proved nigh on impossible. Mm. But in spite of that, we amazingly achieved royal assent on almost 60 bills and passed over 600 pieces of secondary legislation to prepare for Brexit. But like the proverbial swan, whilst we were gliding on the surface, the business managers were paddling furiously underneath. And I pay tribute to each of them and to my superb private office. When the harassment and bullying scandal hit Parliament in 2017, I was so proud to pull together the cross-party coalition that devised the independent complaints and grievance scheme with a clear goal that everyone who works in or visits Parliament should be treated with dignity and respect and that confidentiality should underpin everything. And as leader, I had one of the most beautiful offices in the palace, mm. whose only limitation was the rat living in my waste paper basket. <laughs> <laughs> so when a legislative slot appeared for the Restoration and Renewal Bill came along, we grabbed it. Yeah. Preserving this iconic palace as the seat of our democracy for future generations will be a huge achievement for all those involved, and I wish them success. And a long-awaited change that I was so glad to introduce was to give all members of this House the same rights as workers across the country, and that is to spend time with their newborn or adopted babies, yeah, yeah, yeah. which we did via a new proxy voting system. Which brings me to the third of my three Bs, babies. As many in this House know, better support for the early years is essential to levelling up, to solving health inequalities and to promoting lifelong emotional well-being. In 2011, I launched the 2001 Critical Days campaign with support from every party in this House, from many members of the other place and from almost every early years stakeholder. Frank Field, the late Dame Tessa Jowell, the Honourable Members for Washington and Sunderland, for Manchester Central and for Brighton Pavilion always worked on a cross-party basis and I'm grateful to them. I set up PIP UK as a charity that would provide support across the country for families struggling with a new baby and I pay huge tribute to my honourable friend for East Worthing and Shoreham yeah, yeah, yeah. who took over my early years campaigns and charity responsibilities when I joined the government yeah. and he's done a brilliant job for so many years. And as leader of the Commons, the former Prime Minister asked me to chair an interministerial group looking at early years, how the government could provide better support. The team spent a year researching existing provision, from health visiting to breastfeeding advice to talking therapies to parenting groups, and select committees held detailed inquiries into the impact of early years' experiences on later outcomes. There is no doubt that a focus on this area could be life-changing yeah, for yeah. millions. Yeah. So resigning as Commons leader last summer was a tough decision, driven by my concern that the withdrawal agreement bill, as then proposed, with the potential for a second referendum, would not have delivered our exit from the EU. As leader, I would have had to bring that bill forward, and I couldn't in all conscience do so. I was sorry to see the resignation of my right honourable friend for Maidenhead, the leadership of our country and party once again being challenged by the decision on the EU. No one could have worked harder than her, and I feel sure history will judge her kindly. In the new leadership election, a number of candidates, myself included, supported by my great friends for Daventry and South Derbyshire, sought to offer a way forward for the country. But after defeat in the first round, I gave my wholehearted support to the Prime Minister. I genuinely believe he is the right person to seize the opportunities that await us outside the EU. And it was an honour to serve as Business Secretary in his first Cabinet. 
Brexit readiness was the urgent priority, but setting a new, clear direction for Bayes was top of my agenda. With my ministerial team, we agreed our mission to build a stronger, greener, united kingdom. And to achieve that, our priorities, first, that the UK will lead the world in tackling global climate change, second, that we will solve the grand challenges facing our society, and third, that we will quite simply make the UK the best place in the world to work and to grow a business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's one key observation I would highlight from my six months in Bayes. And that is that our climate change ambitions are not just about doing the right thing, but I believe there's also a huge early mover advantage. UK science and innovation could make the UK green tech sector as big in years to come as UK financial services is today. And I'm confident that my right honourable friend will seize this opportunity. So, Mr Speaker, the last general election showed that when people said in 2016 that they wanted to leave the EU, they really did mean it. And I applaud the Prime Minister for his single-minded focus on getting Brexit done. For my own part, I will now focus my attention in Parliament on that third B, babies. And I look forward to renewing my passion for giving every baby the best start in life. And when the Prime Minister asked me to step aside, he also gave me his word that he will enable me to take forward the early years' work. And I'm delighted that the wheels are in motion. And I want to heartily congratulate him and Carrie for their decision to do their own bit of early years' research. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I will have... You saw that coming, okay. You didn't write it, however. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I will, of course, continue to work hard for my fabulous South Northamptonshire constituency, and I do look forward to spending some more quality time with my family. It's been an incredible ten years, and it ain't over yet. There is no greater honour than to serve community and country, and I will continue to do so with pride. Yeah. Christine Jardine, point of order. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, 